Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our talk talk tonight. My name is Drew Dameron, and I'm the library manager here at the Tokyo American Club. Our special guest this evening is economist, strategist, angel investor, patron, producer, author, podcaster, tech member, and yes, Japan optimist, it's Mr. Cole. <laughs> Mr. Jesper Cole has been researching and investing in Japan since becoming a resident of the country in 1986. Over the past two decades, he has been recognized as one of the top Japan strategists, economists, having worked as chief strategist and head of research for major U.S. investment banks, J.P. Morgan and Merrill Lynch. His analysis and insights have earned him a position on several Japanese government and corporate advisory committees, including Governor Yuriko Koike's advisory board. He has a master's degree from the School of Advanced and International Studies at Johns Hopkins University and was a research fellow at both Tokyo University and Kyoto University. He is a graduate of the Lester B. Pearson College of the Pacific. Following Jesper's presentation tonight, we'll hold an open Q&A for those here in person and virtually. For everyone online, please use the Q&A function to submit your questions to me and I'll pass them on to the speaker on your behalf. <clears throat> for everyone here in the room, if you can please kindly use the microphones when asking your questions or talking with Jesper, that way we can ensure that the 18 people joining us virtually tonight can fully participate and understand what was being asked. Thank you again for being here tonight and please join me in welcoming Jesper to our club. Great. Well, thank you very, very much for a very, very kind introduction. Um, I'm Jesper, and uh, you know, I'm glad that you uh, took time out of your busy schedule here. I want to have a little bit of fun, right? I mean, the world's dark enough as it is, so let's be a little bit optimistic. Um, and uh, you know, for starters, right? Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm from Germany. Um, and uh, I got uh, sent to uh, Canada and the United States for education. And then in 1986, I ended up being shipped by Hopkins University here to Japan. And um, I was supposed to stay for three months. I still have my return ticket. It's on Pan Am. Um, so I guess I'm kind of stuck here. I've been stuck here ever since. Now, we want to talk about economics, we want to talk about capitalism, we want to talk a little bit about finance. But don't worry, all of these things can actually be fun if you get that thing there away. Now, story of my life, since we are going to talk about the economy and, of course, the exchange rate, right? So I arrive in Japan on a scholarship from Hopkins University when the exchange rate, when dollar yen, was at 260. So at the end of every month, I get $1,000 transferred to my account at Kyoto University. And I was a rich man. Trust me, I was the king of Kyoto amongst all the students. But then shortly thereafter, we had September 1986, we had the Plaza Accord, right? And all of a sudden, you know, boom, Jesper becomes a poor man in Kyoto, right? Um, anyway. There's the currency there, story of my life, right? Then I permutate around a little bit. And in 1989, I enter an investment bank, the great S.G. Warburgs, right? Um, as the chief economist there. At the time, can you believe it? Interest rates on a 10-year government bond were 8%. And look, ever since I entered, it's downhill, right? And now, as you know, we've got negative interest rates in many markets. Story of my life, real estate. It's only just been a couple of years ago, right, that the real estate market has actually begun to recover and is now back to where it was uh, roughly, you know, when I arrived in Japan here. You know, stock market has done a little bit better, as you know. Um, meanwhile, in the real world, right, here I left the United States of America, and ever since I left in U.S. stocks, a raging bull market, right? A little bit of up, a little bit of down, right? Real estate market in the United States, yes, there was the global financial crisis, but it really was just a blip. And as you know, we've got record high real estate prices everywhere in the world. So I'm an analyst, I'm an economist, you're supposed to trust my predictions. Look at my personal record. Terrible, right? Anyway, my wife is American, so um, it worked out all right in the end there, right? But massive boom in asset prices in the United States of America. In Japan, a lost generation, right? 
who's better off? And this is interesting, right? Because it's nice when you get older, right? You can sort of step back a little bit. And it's been one generation, right? Basically about 30 years. And, you know, look at who is wealthier, right? This is household sector wealth. So this is not companies. This is not the government. This is you and I, the people. And you actually see that in Japan, the absolute level of household sector wealth, the average person here has $120,000 to his or her name, right? In contrast, unfortunately, in the United States, despite this enormous boom on Wall Street, this enormous boom in real estate, you actually see that the average American, you know, barely has about 80,000 to their name. And then when you look at the distribution, Right? So the top 10% versus the bottom 10%, what do you see? It's kind of embarrassing, right? Of course, Japan does have poor people, right? About 11% of Japanese households have less than $10,000 of net financial assets, right? But in the United States, I mean, God, it's almost one in three who doesn't have $10,000 to the family's name, right? quite interesting, right, that you see this, you read a lot about this, the gap between the rich and the poor, um, you know, and uh, that's why I think that when you step back beyond the here and now, beyond what people talk about on a daily or weekly or monthly basis, that actually the system of capitalism, the system of the free market economy here in Japan has actually created a pretty good outcome. Right. And that's one of the reasons why I think that capitalism, you know, in Japan is actually a potential role model, right, for what goes on in the rest of the world. You know, this is just another set of data there. Again, the top 1%, of course, there's rich people in Japan. There's no question about that. Right. But again, the top 1% in Japan control a little less than 20% of all the wealth. While in the United States, as you can see, it's about 35%. Right now, let's cast the net a little wide. If you run an economy, right, you're not just optimizing for one goal, right? Donald Trump, I think, and I'm totally, you know, non-committal here on anything on politics, right? But he sort of said, I will be judged by whether Wall Street is higher, right? Now, that's a nice, simple goal, right? But when you think about it as a leader, right? There are multiple goals that you're trying to achieve. You as your leader in your company or your division, whatever you do, right? It's not just one goal. It's not just efficiency of capital, right? But you want to maximize for freedom, freedom from government intervention and unfair competition. That's very important. You also want to have equity. You want to have efficiency. Yes, you do want to have security. Disrupt, disrupt, disrupt. Stability is a good thing every once in a while, right? And, you know, of course, yes, you do want economic growth. And I will point to you, I believe that Japan is a fantastic system that optimizes for multiple goals. America is very good at optimizing for one particular goal. Whatever your goal Americans set, we're going to fly to the moon, you will fly to the moon, come hell or high water which is why we love America, right? But overall, optimizing for a multi-stakeholder system with multiple objectives, I think that the Japanese model has actually done a very, very good job. Now, look at some other indicators, right? I was asked, you know, my God, Japan is number one, right? It's like, where is Japan number one? Oh, they haven't invented anything since the Sony Walkman. They still use fax machines, you know, all this gibberish, right, that people like to talk about. Fun conversation over dinner. Can we please focus on what actually matters? This is, you know, something you're not allowed to talk about, right? Social problems, right? So whether it's math, literacy, homicides, imprisonment, teenage births, sorry, obesity, drug and alcohol addiction. You know, there are people who do this for a living. They create these indices, right? And what do you find? You find that, thank you, Japan is the best economy on earth. 
It's very, very interesting, very, very low indicate. It's the one chart. I mean, if you know some Americans see this and say, yeah, I want to be in the top right hand corner. Um, not on this one, just not on this one, right? And it's quite interesting that actually there's a reasonably strong causation and correlation with inequality, right? The more unequal a society gets in terms of the economic benefits and how it is being shared out, right? The greater the incidence, right, of social problems that you actually have. Um, one thing is very important. I'm from Germany originally. Very important to point out that Germany is better than France. This is, this is really important, you know, as sort of a basic little thing that we do need to know. Interesting, right? People talk about the gap between the rich and the poor, right? And some people, I mean, I like to quote Margaret Thatcher, that making the rich poorer doesn't make the poor richer. Oh, let's tax the rich. Maybe we can discuss. Much more important for you as a leader is to actually bring up the bottom 10%. Anybody can curtail and constrain, right, the top. That's very easy, right? But a real leader actually manages to lift the bottom 10%. And Japan, of the OECD countries, of the rich industrialized countries, Japan is the only country where over the last decade, the bottom 10%, the wages, the incomes of the bottom 10% have increased faster than the average. And it's very interesting, about 60% of why that has happened, why the bottom 10% in Japan have been lifted up is what? My wife, uh, sorry, womenomics. No, it is womenomics, the fact that, you know, whether, you know, there's still a long way to go by many measures, but over the last decade, there is no question, right, that the empowerment of women, you know, slowly but surely has started to gather pace here, which is very, very important. You know, but this again, I think as a policymaker, and when you look at economic systems, does it perform, does it not perform? I know that America can create 10 new billionaires because of the COVID crisis. But what do you do to the bottom 10%? And that's something where Japan is very, very good at. And one way that this is actually being achieved is social mobility. I'm sorry, this is the, uh, what is it called? The intergenerational earnings elasticity, right? Which is why many of you dropped economics because of words like this, right? It's very simple. What this tries to measure, right? And look, you can always argue with the data. It basically says, you know, your parents' generation's income level, how much of a determinant is that for the younger generation, for the children's generation, to be successful in economic terms? And again, I'm sorry, Japan is very, very good. It is an egalitarian system that offers equal opportunities, right, um, to even the lower income stratas coming through. And of course, you know, you see the United States again, you're in the wrong spot, right? Very worrying, by the way, for me, if this data is to be believed, is this China point. I mean, if you have to be a son or a daughter of a princeling, of a communist party, uh, you know, head, in order to really succeed economically, that country is going to start to have problems, right? And of course, you know very well that Germany is better than France, you know, on this measure um, as well, you know. Now, so I think we can all agree, you know, the fact just is here you are, you've got a good distribution, right? The middle class is still very real here in Japan, right? Certainly in comparison to the rest of the world, you know, but fine, there is not a lot of growth. This is very true. So now let's have a look at the reality of the Japanese system. What's actually going on in the overall system? And this is where Japan is the undisputed number one, right? And it's the reason why I love being in Japan even after 38 years, right? Because it's the only place where everybody else gets older faster than I do. It's very, very good, right? One in four, in a couple of years, one in four Japanese will be over the age of 70. This is a reality that you have to live with, right? I was once 
asked to explain what this actually means. Well, how many of you have, well, now it's COVID, right? Well, nobody travels anymore, right? But if before COVID, if you can remember that, right? When you took the airplane from Taipei, from Hong Kong, or from Shanghai, right? And you arrive at Narita or at Haneda, you notice that the public walkway, you know, the electric walkway, right? Um, is slower in Japan than it is in the rest of Asia, right? And actually, if you investigate this, six, seven, seven years ago, there was a Gyose Mere, there was a public order to cut the speed of all public escalators by 15%, which is correct policy. I mean, if one in four is over the age of 70, these things become dangerous machine, you cut the average speed, right? Is this good or bad, or therefore you shouldn't be investing in Japan? No, it's just a reality the, the, the real clincher, of course, is that in the United States, it doesn't matter because when you and I arrive at JFK, um, you know, the escalators don't walk, don't work anyways, right? Um, anyway, so you've got this aging thing here, and it's the one pushback I always get. How can you be bullish on a place where in 311 years, nine people are going to be left, right? So hmm. the answer is I do not care about the next 300 years. I care about the next five to six years. And Japan is actually in a demographic sweet spot. You can look it up. About 10 years ago, I gave a TED talk. And the first line was, I want to be reborn as a 23-year-old Japanese. And the reason is very simple. The fact that the number of high school and university graduates is shrinking every year by about 25,000 kids means that my value as a 23-year-old is going to be going up. And that's exactly what is happening. Many of you may have come across this chart. 1996 was dramatic change in Japan. Actually, the change was actually in 1995. How many of you were here in Japan in 1995? There you go. What was 1995? It was... huh? Thank you. It started off, it was the Anos Horiburus, right? It was a terrible year. January, the Kobe earthquake. And this is Kobe. This is the third largest container port, huge logistics hub, etc. right? What happened in March, actually just a couple of days ago was the anniversary, the sarin gas attack. And this is not some people from the outside. This is your own people trying to kill your senior bureaucrats because they attacked Katsumi Gaseki Eki, right? And Kamiacho. Right? Um, and then in June of 1995, we had what? We had the Jusen, right? The Jusen Mundai. We had the credit cooperatives going bankrupt. They were run on banks in some, there was wonderful pictures of like 82 year old men and women carrying their money in cash walking down the streets of Osaka, right? There were bank runs here. This was the real financial crisis. So that was the year when Prime Minister Hashimoto was in charge and they instigated radical change. This was the shot across the bow. The collapse of the bubble economy is real. You will never go back to the way it used to be. And what did they do? Radical labor market reform. It was the death of the salary man. It used to be that part-time or contract or arbeito was only allowed in very specific industries, like farming, for example, so you could hire seasonal workers. In 1995, after these three shocks, in, in the autumn, they had radical labor reform that allowed part-time and contract employment across all segments and all industries. So that was the death of lifetime employment. That was the death of the salary man in the traditional way. And you can see the data is very clear. Since 1996, the only new jobs that were being created were part-time employees, right? And it's a huge shock to the system because a part-time employee versus a full-time employee, what's the difference? The big difference is money, right? You do not get the bonus as a part-time employee. And the bonus over your year, over your annual income is about one third, 
of your entire pay. So it was great for companies, they cut their cost, but it obviously created this lost generation, as it were, right, of people that didn't have full-time jobs, got one third less pay than uh, their parents' generation. And on top of that, if you're a part-time employee, what happens? Two other things. You can obviously get fired, thank you. You don't have the security of the job. But as a result of that, Japanese banks are nasty. If you're a part-time employee, love or money doesn't buy you credit. You cannot get a mortgage. You can barely get a credit card, right? And then the third thing that happens is Japanese are very smart, right? If I've got a part-time job, I can probably get a date if I'm charming, right? But I will never get married, right? So it's very interesting, right, that you had this negative cycle that happened. But again, people sometimes say, oh, Japan's policymakers cannot do radical change. Very, very radical change happened, and it changed you know, the nature of society. Where am I bullish? Why do I want to be reborn as a 23-year-old Japanese? Is exactly because now we're at the other end of the spectrum. Now the supply of labor is actually shrinking. And as a result of that, this is the reverse, right? This is full-time employment. The red line here, you see, was falling, 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 falling. Now, since 2016, 17, for the first time in one generation, for the first time in one generation, full-time employment is actually growing. And it's exciting to see that even during this COVID crisis, right, where a lot of part-time workers, to your point here, were fired, there's no question, but the hiring of full-time employees actually continued, right? Very, very important to see that because you've got companies like Hitachi, companies like Toyota realizing that labor is in short supply. As a result of that, I'm going to lock you in on a full-time contract. And as a result of that, an economic virtuous cycle starts. You've got higher income, you get access to credit, and you get married. Well, maybe. Uh, <laughs> the other thing that has happened, and as a result of this, you may have seen that recently, real estate prices, right? Apartment prices, mansion prices have started to increase very, very nicely, right? And in fact, in Tokyo, in the major areas like Shibuya, for example, they've actually surpassed the peak that they had at the bubble, right? What is driving that is the fact that there is a new generation of Japanese that is having full-time jobs, that is having job security, that is having access to credit, and as a result of that, you actually have a virtuous cycle. Mark my words, I believe that Japan will be the only advanced industrial economy where we are seeing the rise of a new middle class. There are the old, one in four, older than me, ha, huh, for the moment, right? They are doing whatever they're doing. We'll talk about that in a second. But much more important is that the young generation in Japan is actually having price power their quality of jobs, their quality of income, their amount of income and access to credit is actually rising. Now, what about the old ones? You know what? This is the richest baby boom generation on earth. Remember, I showed you the data in aggregate of how much wealth there is. Now, let's look how that wealth is distributed, right? You basically see that of the total wealth, right? You've got basically of the $30 trillion worth of total wealth, you've got approximately 20 trillion owned by people who are over the age of 70. Fantastic, right? So over the next decade, over the next six years, you will have the equivalent of 500 trillion yen, which is about one times GDP, transferring from one generation to the other generation. This is going to create huge support to the overall system. Now, there are some wonderful frictions in this. This looks great. Uh, I once was on a government committee where then we basically proposed, you know, like to speed this up. Why don't you change the inheritance tax and the gift taxes so that you speed up the transfer of money so that you can get the economy out of the slump a little bit earlier, right? And so the little minion from the Ministry of Finance runs away, comes back after 12 minutes and says, ah, Kurzan, the average age of people receiving inheritance is 68 years old. <laughs> so you need to skip. I mean, there's always frictions, right, in the whole system, 
right? But this transfer of the baby boom generation is very, very important, which is, by the way, it's true for the United States as well. I mean, the baby boom generation in aggregate is not as rich as the Japanese one, but the transfer of wealth that is occurring, and as a result of that, the support to the economy and to the purchasing power of the people, um, you know, is actually quite significant. So that's sort of the story on the consumer, right? Very quickly, what about companies, right? For 30 seconds, right? Don't want to bore you too much with it. When I look at a company, I don't know, when I give you free investment advice. When you look at a company, you want to figure out what they do. What else do you want to do? You want to know who owns them. It's very important. So who owns Japan Inc.? And Japan Inc., of the entire market capitalization, so the equity of all of Japan, it used to be half of it was tied up in cross shareholdings, right? So Japan Inc. owned Japan Inc. And it was the Mitsui Group, it was the Mitsubishi Group, the Sumitomo Group with all the cross shareholdings, right? This has broken down. It is now cross shareholdings are less than 5% of the entire market. They continue to go down. And as a result of that, what has happened is that Japan has changed from being a system of insiders. If you were not part of the Mitsubishi group, good luck. You had no idea what was actually going on. The accounts were terrible. You had no idea on corporate strategy and you could never get in, right? Now it's become much, much more competitive, right? And much, much more open. One big difference between Japan and the United States is the fact that Japan has no superstars. I'm sorry, this is my day job, right? Trying to figure out which companies to invest in, right? And this is like ROE. So that's like the efficiency of capital effectively, right? And you see, when you plot this out, you know, the distribution in Japan, you know, on average, the Japanese uh, uh, efficiency of capital is around eight, 9%. In the United States, it's about 14, 15%, right? But the interesting thing is you see in Japan, the distribution, what percentage of companies has what type of efficiency? Japan is kind of like a bell curve. You see America is actually quite flat, but does have, you know, basically about 15% of American companies are absolute superstars in terms of capital efficiency. Japan has no superstars. Why does Japan not have any superstars? Huh? Why? They're not aggressive. They're not risk takers. Nonsense. The economic structure. This is looks at all industries from hairdressers to steel companies to chip makers to airlines. And it calculates on average the top four firms. What is your market share? Right. And you see in the United States now Basically, the top four firms in the average industry control one third of all the revenues. It's actually gone up. America has become very monopolistic or oligopolistic, right? In contrast, in Japan, it's 11%. There is so much competition here that as a result of that, for you and I to become a superstar, right, where we have price power, where we can actually raise margins, you know, is very, very difficult. It's quite interesting, you know, that you have this difference uh, in the overall system here. Size matters, right? This looks at the economy and it looks at the market capitalization. So the economy is about four times bigger in America. The market, the equity market is about seven times bigger. But the number of listed companies is about the same. So again, that's why you can't get superstars. That's why you don't have high performing companies. What's going to happen? What's going to change this? Mr. Kishida and his new capitalism? Mr. This, that, or the other? No, we overrate politicians, particularly in Germany. Sorry, I'm allowed to say this. <laughs> um, look, the bulk of corporations, are obviously small and medium sized companies, right? What you see is that you know of the sort of 3.6 million companies in Japan, basically 2.4, the owner is over the age of 70 now, right? The owner who doesn't have a successor because his son or his daughter doesn't want to do the business is basically 1.3 million companies. 
So as a result of that, what are we seeing right now? Unprecedented consolidation. There's a record M&A boom going on, right? For the large listed companies, there are obviously other factors at work. But for the belly of the beast, right, for the economy, for small and medium-sized companies, again, the demographic sweet spot, consolidating companies, giving you the opportunity to buy your competitor and thereby scale up the business in a way that was never before possible, that now is actually becoming possible. Cash versus debt, very quickly, right? Tons, I mean, this is, this is net debt. This is in Japan. Corporate Japan is net positive. Japan, what does that mean? It means Japan doesn't need banks, right? Banks are irrelevant, right? Of course, in America, it's the opposite. The more, the more debt, the better it is. Final point on corporations, right? I love this. This is my favorite chart. This is the amount of cash that companies have on their balance sheet, okay? And you can see Japan, France, China, communists, right? England, they don't know what they are. Korea, competitive. America, competitive. Brazil. Everywhere over the last 10 years, the amount of cash that you have on your balance sheet has gone up, right? Which is absurd. Because cash over the last 10 years earned exactly zero of interest. But you're supposed to be the greedy one. Why do you have so much cash? Well, lots of reasons, right? Of course, Japan is the undisputed world champion, right? I once showed this chart to Prime Minister Abe, and he was frothing at the mouth. He said, let's tax them. Look, you could boost GDP by one times, right? Now, it's more complicated than that, right? Can I digress for 30 seconds? Do I have time? He nods. This is good, OK? You notice there's one country where the cash on balance sheet has actually come down. Germany, why is that? You read every day it's about corporate governance, right? Corporate governance is like karaoke, right? If you don't like the conversation, you take your person to karaoke because you don't have to talk to them, right? So if you don't like the conversation, let's talk about corporate governance. Oh, yes, we need more women. Oh, yes, we need more foreigners. All this good stuff, right, that is going on. These are cosmetic issues. Germany is the only country that actually has a different model of corporate governance, which is what? By law, half of your board is from the labor unions. So if you and I run a company, right, and we make money, we pay ourselves, we decide we don't need to raise the dividend, we don't want to do a share buyback. We don't want to buy another company and we don't want to build another factory. The labor union says, okay, then it goes to us. Right? So it's quite interesting. All I try to highlight here, and sorry, this is not about Japan, you know, is the fact that when you talk about corporate governance, you want to be a little bit careful, look at some of the financials as well. And, you know, there are some big differences there. Now, let me go. It's interesting, right? So companies have a lot of cash, right? If you make money, where does the money go? Who gets it? In America, basically about half of the profits go to the owners of the company, right? To the, to the shareholders, right? Um, in, a, in Europe, it's about 40%. Asia is about 30%. Japan is about 20%. Used to be 15%. It's gone up a little bit. Fine. But the capitalists don't pay, don't get paid. Labor, this is incredibly cool, right? This is, again, as a percentage of profits, how much goes to labor? And you see that, look, Americans actually pay more than the Japanese, right? And of course, again, the Germans pay the highest, right? So it's quite interesting, right, if there's a criticism of the Japanese model of capitalism, it is the fact that you're not paying anybody except keeping money, you know, on deposit, right? And as a result of that, I mean, you can see where now again, why are you bullish Japan? Look at this, I'm cheap. I'm so cheap. If you and I want to hire a software engineer in Japan, it's now 15, 20% cheaper than in Vietnam, right? So this is a great time, you know, to actually have this sort of arbitrage. Japan has priced itself back into the market. The real problem, you know, is of course the way labor 
is being treated. You know, and it's interesting. You know, this is uh, something that we need to see whether it's going to come out, right? Seniority matters in this country, right? I remember when I was the head of research at JP Morgan, right? Putting somebody in charge who is younger than somebody else in the division was basically a no-go, right? Just because of seniority. And it's going to be very interesting to see, right, whether now with COVID, with a younger generation in short supply, they become more demanding. And I believe that a move towards a greater merit-based system is something that we're going to start to see evolve, right? Um, you know, as we go into the future. Very quickly, challenges. The first one was for me to lose weight. No, that is Konishki. That's the son of a friend of mine. And I want to stop, just want to give you this. Look, interesting, right? So, sorry, what is this? The, you see the blue line is employee compensation. So what do you get paid for the work that you do, right? The red line is your disposable income. So after taxes, after your asset income, how much you got, right? And you see this COVID distortion, right? Where the government basically pumped in all this sort of support measures and it was taken out basically very quickly. The interesting thing is that we are actually back to where we were before COVID, right? You see unemployment compensation, you're basically back to the trend that was in place before COVID. You know, the money has come in, has gone out, right? So that's all fine. The problem is this. So the money that people get is back to where it was before, right? But look at the red line is your disposable income. The yellow line is consumption. And you see this divergence that's coming through. Mr. and Mrs. Watanabe, for an economist looking at the data, is back to where they were before, but they're spending less and less and less and less. Why is that? And you can say, oh, it's because of the COVID uncertainty. It's because of this, that, or the other. Oh, I want to make myself unpopular. It's not because Japanese are not stupid. This blue line here is the money that you pay to the government the Japanese people, right? In terms of your social security contribution um, and in terms of your healthcare contribution, right? That's the blue line here. The red line is the transfers that you receive from the government, right? And you see this wonderful distortion here with the COVID money being pumped in, right? But you basically see that it is always the blue line running over the red line. So why is there this problem of underconsumption? Why does Mr. and Mrs. Watanabe continue to save more? It's because they know that taxes will go up. They know that the healthcare system is going to need additional funding or is going to cut the benefits that are coming through. That's the big issue. It's not inflation. It's not all this wonderful stuff. It is the fact that, unfortunately, the government deficit is actually starting to, uh, uh, to haunt the overall system. Finally. Look, I mean, remember this, right? This was the opening ceremony of the Tokyo Olympics. It was the one part where you didn't fall asleep. I'm oh, sorry, it's, I'm personally speaking here, right? So this is, Japan is cool, right? Now, it was Intel drones, never mind that, right? But there is a cool element to Japan. Four weeks later, this happened in Shanghai, right? Similar festival. Right, they had the drone fireworks, and at the end of the festival, right, the drones went into a QR code. If you took a picture with your selfie of this thing, you got a free video game. That's cool and commercial. And I think, you know, for Japan's leaders, right, to actually make the jump, being cool they are, but can you make the bridge from being cool to actually being commercial? That I think is one of the key challenges that you actually have. I think my time is kind of up. Uh, we can talk forever, but I thought maybe it's probably a good idea to uh, open the floor for any specific questions or issues that you have, whether they're big and long-term or whether they're concerning energy prices or the currency, please feel free to ask whatever you want to do. I hope you found it a little bit stimulating, a little bit all over the place, but um, don't forget, 
the only country where we will see the rise of a new middle class, demographic sweet spot, and corporate Japan is open for business. Thank you. Thank you, Jesper. All right, do we have any questions from the floor? Please. Is Japan proof that modern monetary theory might actually work? Or perhaps the same question asked differently, how much of what you've displayed would have been would have happened if the government wasn't pumping, pumping, pumping money into the system? No, oh, thank you very, very much. I think that, you know, the answer is um, Modern monetary theory, whether Japan is a model of that, because I'm never quite sure what modern monetary theory actually is supposed to be. But what happened in very simple terms, in my interpretation, right, is that we had an ideology of the Ministry of Finance and an ideology of the Bank of Japan that were at loggerheads, right, basically in throughout the 1990s, right? Um, but what happened with Prime Minister Abe, right? And remember, what happened with Prime Minister Abe was very, very interesting. You had an incompetent government that just couldn't get things done, right? Um, and you had a real existential threat because of the Senkaku Islands, right? Because it, it's one thing, it's like, you know, ho, ho, we've got these islands there, right? But if you say, these are my islands, that's like you coming after my wife. It changes the conversation, right? And, you know, so Abe, you know, came back to power on the promise that they will not do things the way things are being done. And so they appointed a MOF guy, Mr. Kuroda, to the Ministry of Finance. The first thing he said is, we're going to do whatever it takes. And they did whatever it takes, including buying equities in the Japanese stock market, right? So massive amount of pumping in, record amount of supplementary package after record amount of supplementary package. And there's no question, right, that the combination that you actually have coordinated policy where yes, the treasury and the central bank work hand in hand to achieve a common goal. There's no question, right, um, you know, that that worked very, very well and very, very powerful. Um, you know, to to kickstart Japan, you know, out of deflation, and in particular, to really kickstart the asset inflation cycle that came through at the at the very very end. Does that answer your question? Huh? Okay. Hi. Good. Karaoke. Any other questions or concerns or issues? Hi, Dozo. Yes. Um, I have one question that I've always had a concern about in Japan is that um, why would you say that Japan has such a high tax rate yeah. and has such a high debt to GDP level? Right. Whereas, uh, what are they doing wrong with the money that we're paying them? Can, can you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a very, very good point. I mean, why does Japan such have, have such a high tax rate, right? You're going to kill me for saying this, but the origin of Japan's tax system is the United States of America, right? Okay. The United States of America, when they came into Japan, they basically had one clear objective. Many of you may have read Ruth Benedict, right? Um, it was basically to make conglomerate capitalism, where you had eight families, the Zaibatsu families, controlling, you know how much they controlled? More than Elon Musk. They controlled 80 to 85% of the Japanese economy. Eight families, right? And the Americans came in, which is why we love America, and said like, this will never happen again. So it was actually the University of Chicago, Professor Shoup, right, who designed a system that will wipe out all family wealth over three generations. That was the fundamental philosophy behind the whole thing, right? And then in the 1980s, there were some income tax cuts that actually happened, right? So the top income tax rate went from basically 75% down to about 45%, right? And that was part of, you know, sort of the global trend at the time there. But still, relative to the United States of America, taxes were always high, right? Now, 
Why is the deficit so high? The answer is indeed the fact that the public expenditure, right, has continued to run away. And whether it was bridges to nowhere, whether it was the amazing infrastructure uh, programs that you have, right, all over the uh, uh, all over the country, and now what do you have? You've got a socialized medical system, right, and a socialized pension system, and given the aging of the society, basically the cost of your social security expenditure goes up by roughly 1% of GDP every year because of the aging that is coming through, right? And that's very difficult to cut back because to cut it back, you would need to do what? Entitlement reform. You would actually have to cut the promises that you made to the baby boom generation and take it away. Now, Mr. Suga, right, and I'm very biased, I'm a very big fan, right? Mr. Suga did actually do entitlement reform. You may have seen that like anybody over the age of 72, right, the pension payouts were being cut back, right? Um, so why was he unpopular? There was all this COVID stuff going on, but behind the scene, there was actually also taking more money, right, relative to the promises that the Japanese government has, had actually made. Yeah, if that makes sense. Now, it's very interesting with the, with the debt to GDP, because uh, I remember, you know, I was at JP Morgan at the time, and, you know, when debt to GDP broke through 100% for the first time, you know, you had people like George Soros, right? And interest rates were maybe three, three and a half percent. They were yelling, short, nobody, you know, can do this. There's so much debt. Well, the cost of money, right? The cost of debt went down to zero. Right, even negative, right? Um, so it's quite interesting. And I will give you now the arithmetic of the deficit. You can no longer fix it, right? It's very easy to show on sort of a debt sustainability scenario. But I will do one other thing, which is why I'm not worried about government deficits anywhere in the world. For every dollar of government debt, there is about $2.3 of private savings that are being generated, right? And that's true even in the United States, right? That is particularly true for the emerging economies, whether it's India, whether it's Indonesia, whether it's the People's Republic of China. Ben Bernanke, the you know, head of the Federal Reserve at some point, he made his mark, or one of the ways he made his mark, he published a wonderful paper called The Saving Surplus. You know, you've got a balance sheet, right? The debt, which is what you focus on because you need to raise taxes. But the irony is that savings are growing faster than debt. One way to explain that we have negative interest rates is the fact that there's not enough debt. Because if there were more debt, interest rates would be higher. Right? Yeah, in particular, the debt to GDP number is a wonderful political measure, right? And it works within the nation state. But capital markets, the people who finance the deficit, are global, right? And yes, it's true, America cannot finance its own deficit. It needs Japan, it needs Germany, right, uh, you know, to do that. But welcome to the real world. These are global capital markets, and they work very, very well. Right? So it's quite interesting that you have that. If I were a politician and I've got a bone to cut because I think that, you know, social security spending or education spending is too high, right? I will rave that flag. Oh my God, the specter of the deficit. But as an investor, I never worry about the deficit. It's immaterial. I worry about savings. Right? Please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Who owns those savings? What's the distribution of those savings if it's $2.3? So it's you, your sister, your brother. It's the household sector. Right. And it is the corporate sector. Okay. Right. So the Japanese household sector has 2,000 trillion yen, right, which is four times of GDP of financial assets. Right. You know, so this is money lying on 60% of that is money lying on deposit at the banks. The rest is invested, you know, in other, in other financial instruments. The same is true in the United States. The same is true in the, in, 
in, in, in Europe, the same is true in India, the same is true in China. But of the $2.3, we're talking about different demographics, different sectors of the society owning percentages. I'm curious about yeah. where the $2.3 is, you know, the average, but if it's the top 1% owning so much more of it. It's not, it's, it's interesting. You can do the top 1% debate, right? To me, you know, the more interesting debate is the generational difference. Right. And the difference being that, like I showed in Japan, right, that basically you've got 70 percent of the assets owned by people who are two thirds of the assets owned by people who are over the age of 70. It's true everywhere. It's true in the U.S. as well. Your parents are richer than you, particularly in this day and age. You know, and there is plenty of statistics, right, that show that, for example, in the United States of America, the ability of the younger generation, the ability of the people in their 20s to actually save, right, has gone down because number one, we have a geek economy now, right, where the income levels are much, much lower, right? Plus, you've got the $2.7 trillion of, of student debt that people have to pay up, which our parents' generation didn't have because they had the GI Bill. Right. I mean, sorry, just to be blunt. So I think it's nice to focus on Elon Musk and to focus on the top 10 percent. The much more worrying element right in the Western world. This is true for Germany. This is true for the uh, United States of America is this generational inequality. That's why I started out by showing that the ability of even if you're poor or if you come from a lower income level in Japan, your ability to actually climb the social ladder, to climb the socioeconomic ladder in Japan is actually very high. Why, unfortunately, in many other countries, it seems to actually have gone down. It's a real, so it's interesting. Like, I, I love this idea. Let's, let's bash up on Mr. Bezos and why does he fly to space when we've got all these, these wonderful problems. Yes, this is nice, but the fundamental forces, can you, allow for your children, can you allow for your grandchildren to have a better future than yourself? That ultimately is the American dream. It's the Indian dream. It's the Indonesian dream. It's anybody's uh, uh, dream. Yes, I'm interested in uh, the notion of a meritocracy and social mobility in the United States as well as Japan and the differences. And I'm wondering when you talk about the transfer of wealth from the older generation to the next generation. Um, it's, is it taxed differently in Japan than it is in the United States? I can't remember what the number is in the United States, but I think it's pretty high. It's like $6 million on an estate. It has to be over that amount before it's taxed. And I'm just wondering, first of all, is that a good policy? Because it seems like there's an opportunity for the government to kind of level the playing field for the next generation a little bit by taking some of that and redistributing it. Um, don't want to sound like a communist, but I'm just but, but worried you, but, about, you know, mobility. And then I'm wondering what the policy is in Japan and how so, much they tax at so, what level. So so it's, it's very, very interesting. So you, you're completely right. I'm not a, I'm not an estate tax lawyer. Right. Um, you know, but, you know, basically, you know, the the estate taxes and the 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 mm -hmm tax-free benefits that you can transfer, right, are very high. Plus, you've got a different legal system where you can transfer via trusts, which, for example, in this country, you can't do effectively, right? Um, you know, but you're completely right, you know, that the risk of a plutocracy, right, is very high, right, in the Anglo-American world, right? Um, you know, in Japan, that risk is very, very low. Right, because you know the inheritance tax system, right? Um, still, I mean, they haven't changed it. In fact, the inheritance tax rates have actually marginally gone up, and what is exempt has actually been cut back, right? So that this transfer of wealth. I mean, look at the founder of Sony Corporation. I mean, this is like the this was better than Tesla in our days, right? Look at the family. They're not flying around in private jets, you know. Um, no. They're taking the first class ticket that that's all fine right but it's not you know this super excess that has actually been created but again i think and this is not 
it's interesting that you use the word communist or socialist, right? Because as an economist, you know, I always get a little bit itchy because I, I'm, I'm not sure what that means anymore, right? The real question that we all have got to ask ourselves, which is where I come back to Japan, right? What legacy do we leave for our children? What is the opportunity set for our children, right? And it's nice to say you can have a Twitter account. It's nice you can have a, a, you know, a geek job and you can move back and forth. But at the end of the day, right, it does come down to the economic achievement because there comes a time when you don't want to be an Uber driver anymore because now you're married, now you have a kid, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's quite interesting, I think, you know, to sort of focus, you know, on what is the goal that you're actually trying to achieve. You know, and it's not good enough to say, in my personal opinion, it's not good enough to say, oh, it's all about education. Yes, of course, it's all about education, right? But there are other issues that are, that are at place as well. I can give you another example. I mean, when you look at the, 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 the you know, like, why is there such a concentration of, 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 you know, why is it that 15 people in America control 30% of all the wealth or whatever the exact data is, right? Where do these people come from? How come they're able to create a monopoly in the way that Jeff Bezos has been able to create an effective monopoly, right? Is that right? Is that wrong? We all admire Jeff Bezos. We all want to be Jeff Bezos, right? As a goal, that's something very, very worthwhile. Be ambitious. Break rules. Create something new. That's the spirit of America, right? But there do come, in my personal opinion, you know, there do come limits. And again, the real question is, what's in it for our children and grandchildren? That to me is at the end of the day, and that's where Japan is actually in a very, very good way. Can I give you another anecdote on that, which is very relevant to what, where we are right now? Because America raised interest rates, right? Do you know that this country, before COVID, right? This country was the only place where God forbid, sorry, Anybody here who works for Starbucks? No, it was the only, on, on the back of the envelope calculation, it was the only place, Tokyo was the only major urban area, right? Where if you worked at a Starbucks in Otemachi in downtown, and you got the average salary, you, know, you worked the average hour, you could actually afford to buy an apartment within a one hour commute. This is impossible in Los Angeles, in Shanghai, in Berlin, in London, etc. right? Why do I say that? Asset prices matter. Okay, why am I saying this? Remember when I arrived in Japan, we had the bubble economy, right? The boom years, Nikkei goes to 40,000, you know. Japan is the only ruling elite that consciously burst a bubble economy. I'm sorry for a little history lesson, right? In December, on December 19th, 1989, they appointed a new governor to the Bank of Japan, right, Governor Mieno. And he gave his inaugural speech at the Imperial Hotel. And there is this little man, right, and he bows and he says, thank you very much for appointing me to this position. The second sentence, bad things are happening in our country. A graduate from the best university working for the best company can no longer dream of ever living in an apartment that is within a two hour commute. This is a bubble, this is bad, and I will burst it. And they increased interest rates from 3% to 8% in seven months. And that burst the bubble economy very consciously, right? To basically allow for the next generation, right? The baby boom generation had just basically, they'd, they'd all been, been employed, right? It was very, very interesting that you actually have that. Right? America had that with Paul Volcker, right? No question about that. Again, this is like, I don't care what people say. I don't care what public opinion polls say. This is the right thing to do, trust me. And God, the early 80s were horrible in America, right? In many ways. Anyway, sorry, not to be. Thank you, Jasper. We've got uh, three questions in the queue. Oh, one, one... Hello, hello, Q. How are you? Thank one, you very much for joining one, us. One on. But Richard online asks, Given the potential shift to meritocratic managers and the forecast consolidation, do you see superstar companies emerging in Japan in the future? Yes, absolutely. 
Absolutely. I mean, I'm very, very bullish, um, you know, on the fact that, you know, you've got this industrial consolidation coinciding with a time when pay for performance and as a result of that, actually labor mobility. Yes, it's difficult to hire a Japanese because it's a very competitive market. It used to be if you were a graduate of Keio University, of course, Mitsubishi will hire me. Now it goes the other way around. It's like, hello, Mitsubishi, what do you got for me? What do you mean work-life balance? You never heard of this? Right? What do you mean I don't get pregnancy leave, et cetera, et cetera, right? These are very real conversations that are actually happening. And I think that you know, the combination that you've got the old dying out, selling their businesses, you've got the young being more competitive and more demanding because then you know what, what is their worth. I think as a result of that, you will see some stellar corporations actually rise in Japan. Whether they're going to be in the field of finance or whether they're going to be in the field of IT, I doubt it, because that's something where America and India and a whole bunch of other countries are very good. But I think, you know, in many, many of the analog businesses, right, Japan's dominance is actually going to be increasing. This is the analog kingdom of the world. And the world is analog. I'm not about to go into the metaverse. And last time I checked, my, my children who are in their 20s also have no interest in this. So be real. Hi, somewhere in the back. Hey. Uh, hi there, my name's Charles. Thanks for your presentation. Picking up on that last point and another point you made, how the small medium enterprises in Japan are highly distributed to the 70 plus age group. Add to that what you said about the 23 age category and what they're seeking in terms of employment, the agriculture sector, food security and uh, domestic production. I'd be keen to hear your thoughts on how you match those two. Oh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And I'm so glad that you bring that up, right? Because, you know, in the agricultural sector, right, you've got a very, very outdated, right, policy priority, right, which basically, you know, almost very openly fosters inefficiencies, right, of land usage, right? And, you know, the whole revolution that's going on in agri-tech, right, the whole revolution that's going on in synthetic bio and synthetic foods, for example, is something that Japan is unfortunately not embracing, right? And that's very, very much a detriment, right, that you actually have. And it's interesting that you bring that up because I was just a couple of weeks ago, right, at the prime minister's office. I don't mean to drop names, but and they were talking about, oh, you know, we got to be, we got to become self-sufficient in all of this. It's like, what are you talking about? You know, basically, slightly less than half of your caloric intake is produced domestically. If you want to be self-sufficient on food, you're going back to the 13th century. You know, this is a pipe dream. You know, and it's very, very sad to see how stubborn, right, the, um, you know, agricultural cooperatives are, right, uh, in terms of actually the stranglehold that they actually have. Now, the good news is, as you know very well, if you and I are venture capitalists, right, here and there, there is now a next generation of farmers, right, who are technology savvy, who actually opt very consciously out of the uh, Nogyo system. Right. And, you know, some of them are very, very successful in what it is that they're actually doing. Right. But you're, you're completely right. I mean, this is this is a huge, you know, area of, you know, where stronger political leadership, right, would do very well. But it's tough because two thirds of the people who are voting are over the age of 60. Right. So I always, together with Robert Feldman, a friend of mine, uh, you know, another economy, we once made a proposal and said, well, it's very easy, fix Japan, you know, by giving anybody under the age of 35 double voting, right? <laughs> if you did that, you could, you could, the inherent conservatism, right, that you have, right, uh, needs to be, dare I use this word, disrupted, right? Anyway. So. <clears throat> Come in. We will. Kein Problem. Great. Thank you. Hello. 
you? Hi, yes, we're very good, thanks. Good to see you again. Still awake. Indeed. So I have two simple questions, they're different. The first one is um, something I've read about what you've said, but what do you think is Japan's chance to reemerge, become a player on the Asian stage as a financial market? That's number one. Number two is more about farming and, and, and so forth. And considering most of the farmers out in the countryside are eight years old, wonderful people, how is that going to transgress? What's going to happen in the future as far as farming goes? Those Look, two. I'm not an expert on, on the agriculture side. I'm not an expert, right? Uh, it's an area where there is enormous technological progress, right? That is actually happening and Japan is not embracing it. You know, so that's, you know, that's, that's a darker side, right? That what's you actually happen? have there. Huh? But what's going to happen without, I mean, where are the farmers going to come from? Well, you know, you then open up the door very quickly, right, towards immigration, right? Um, you know, and immigration at the lower level, as it were, right? And whether that's going to be embraced, right, by the regions or not by the regions, right? It's very interesting, you know, because the immigration debate, right, and labor intensive farming, right? Can you upscale it? Can you consolidate it? Can you put more capital, more machinery into the, into the place? Or do you get new labor into the whole thing, right? It's a big, big question mark that you actually have. For Tokyo as a financial center, right? Um, it's interesting. Governor Koike, you know, asked me, you know, to sort of be on this committee. And I sort of said, Yuriko, and sorry, I've known her for, for, for 30 years or so, right? And Yuriko, I've been here 30 years. This is the eighth time people ask me, you know, to sort of do something on Tokyo as a financial center. Why am I going to do this, right? Oh, this time is different, right? Now, I actually do think that this time is different, right? In the sense of that you have for the first time, you know, an initiative that started with the Tokyo government, right? that is now actually embraced by the national regulator, by the Ministry of Finance, by the FSA, and where you have as members of Tokyo Financial City, you for the first time actually have the big Japanese domestic players. So it's, it's interesting, right? Now, is it gonna be New York? Is it gonna be Chicago? Is it gonna be Shanghai? Is it gonna be Singapore? Absolutely not. Absolutely not, right? So how is this going to evolve? I think the recognition that finance is something that does create high quality jobs, that finance is now part of an overarching ecosystem of innovation. It's very difficult for Ms. Koike to stand in front of the people and say, we need special regulation for greedy bankers. But if you say we need special legislation, special regulation for smart city, for Innovation Hub Tokyo, Innovation Hub Japan, that actually works. We get there eventually. Remember, the Japanese are awesome at running marathons. They are terrible at sprinting. Sir, there was somebody in the back. I can see how you'd want to be a 23-year-old Japanese man or woman, uh, most likely. Isn't that the problem? Um, if the country keeps people outside, if the government keeps people outside the country, and the 23-year-old men and women are complacent because they are a rare commodity and they're going to get large inheritances, which make them complacent. And so how are we going to get the, the innovation that the country needs without bringing diversity in from outside. So, thank you. So I, I absolutely love your point. And this is like, it's so comfortable here. Why would you go outside? And I'm in high demand, right? Um, you're exactly right. So the level of ambition, right? Do you actually want to conquer the world, right? Can you foster that? 
right? That's the bigger question mark that you actually have. I'm excited because in the Olympics that we just had last year, was it last year? Yeah. Was it this? No, this, what? <laughs> last year. Last year. <laughs> It was last year. No, no, but in the Olympics, I mean, you know, the, the, the youth did extremely well, right? Uh, the, the, the Japanese youth. So, so you know, I, I always like to believe that there is ambition, right? And I think that, you know, over the last 30 years, because of the collapse of the bubble economy, because of the hardships that you had, because of the regime uncertainty with so many changes in government, right? Everybody played defensive. No, nobody played offensive. Right. And I'm firmly of the opinion that over the next five years, right, that you will see Japan playing more offensive again. But I think you put your your finger on on something very, very important because it is very comfortable. The world's a scary place. Why go overseas? Right. How can you change that? But the good companies, right, the ones that will become the superstars of Japan, they will actually do this. We've got time for one more question over here on the this side. Which one? Okay, just you. you everybody ask their question. We answer them in one set. Mentioned the I word immigration, but you did in the context of agriculture. How about more generally? <laughs> so, 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 sorry. I'm going to tell you an anecdote which basically sums it up, right? And it goes back to your point to some extent, right? Because I was on this government committee and there was this thing about immigration and they all go, oh, course on, course on. People like you, we love, right? People with a PhD and that's, a, sorry, sorry. I don't have a PhD. And your problem is something else. So six, seven years ago, a Japanese friend of mine calls me. His son was about to graduate from MIT, right? Who's an engineer, average student, whatever, right? And I've met him a couple of times. So Ito-san says, oh, can you give Hiroshi some advice? He's got a job offer from a German company, from a Japanese company, and from an American company. So I said, Ito-san, what do you want me to tell your son? Because if he goes and joins the American company, if he's good and lucky, in 15 years time, he can run the company, right? If he joins the German company, if he's good and lucky in 15 years time, he can be in charge of a region like Asia or Latin America, right? If he joins the Japanese company in, and he's good and lucky in 15 years time, what's it gonna be, Kacho? I mean, sorry, this comes back to your point, right? And this is something that's very difficult to convey. Tanoshi kyoso, like happy competition, right? That particularly, you know, whether it's young or old, it doesn't matter, but that it's ability that actually counts rather than seniority. Can you attract the A team to come to Japan? Right now, the A team is not interested unless you're in design, architecture, or fashion, right? Nobody wants to come to Japan. In my world, in finance, impossible. Why would you do that? What? Uh, I, the, I think that that's an issue, you know, that for the last two years, you're absolutely right, you know, but I think overall, you know, that's, uh, that's debatable, right? But so that's, I think the sort of answer on, on the immigration side of things, right? And that's where, look, the world is a competitive place, right? If you are, remember that chart here? You know, if you're a software engineer, you're gonna come and work for Japan? And you're, oh, the air is clean. It's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> the food is good, I know, right? Uber Eats is not so bad in Palo Alto or even in Delhi or Bangalore, right? Anyway, so there were one or two other questions. Yes, please. Thank you. I just steal your microphone. I have actually have a million questions, but I'm going to limit it to one. Um, I think you're absolutely right that uh, the country, for a number of reasons and culturalisms, uh, their um, domestic talent is largely untapped. But that's a whole nother tech talk. So I just want to ask you specifically about how you feel um, 
not specific to finance, but in general, a lot of foreigners here leading companies, um, the Gone, Kelly, more recently, Hill situation, how this is going to impact people, um, foreigners abroad, before uh, they would think about coming to lead a company in Japan. Thank you. No, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, there's no question that, uh, you know, all of these three cases that you mentioned most recently, you know, and, you know, the, 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 the one involving Nicole, right? Um, it's made my job very difficult, right? Attracting people to come to Japan, you know, because again, the world is a competitive place. Right. Um, and, you know, how do I attract top global talent? Right. And top global talent, you know, comes at a price. Right. It's not it's not about being greedy, but there is a market price. Right. Um, so it's. Um, this, uh, we, we can have a long glass of wine about, you know, I mean, I personally, because I've worked in finance for the last 30 years, I know two people who for block trading irregularities spend time in prison. It's just that that's not written up in the financial times, you know, now, you know, if, if this had happened, you know, and it had only involved Japanese, which is perfectly plausible, right? Um, you know, I think that in this particular case, right, again, it would have been a minor article, right, in the Wall Street Journal and the, and the Financial Times, right? Um, and, you know, are you setting a precedent treating foreigners unfairly? I think the answer is no, right? That's my personal opinion. I'm not a legal expert, but, you know, which is, by the way, sorry, for 30 seconds, and then I'll stop there. I mean, Japan is, does apply the rule of law, right? Um, well, you know, it, it, as in everywhere, right? Um, or maybe not in San Diego, right? But, um, you know, so, for example, you know, one of the things for Tokyo as a financial center, right? It's now all about green finance, right? You want green finance, you want finance that is with ESG, et cetera, et cetera. But that's all starting out right now. It all sounds very good. We're going to not just make money, but we're also going to save the world. Excellent. Let's move a year forward or two years forward. Who is going to check? Who is going to make hold accountable that the policies that were promised actually are being implemented? And mark my word, I believe that Japan will emerge as the one center where managers will actually be held accountable, right, for the goals that, that they set and did not deliver on, right? Because again, in my personal opinion, certainly compared to the rest of Asia, let's not talk about America for, or, or Europe for 30 seconds, right? Certainly for the rest of Asia, you know, the exercise of the rule of law, right, you know, is certainly being practiced here in Japan. Anyway, if that answers you. Sorry, we could go on forever. Do we have one more question? We may have time to squeeze in one more yes. question. Uh, sorry, he had his hand up before. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> we have a rolling blackout some, for some reason. What do you attribute that to? Does it have anything to do with energy markets and, and, and Ukraine and Russia? What, right now? Here in Japan. And, just, and, we're, and, and further to that question, how do you see uh, Japan's economy being affected by the, uh, I, I don't know, the, uh, uh, the, by the, uh, by the off, off, offloading of the Russian and Ukrainian economies from the global economy? So th thank you very much. I mean, you know, specifically, you know, what has happened over the last, uh, you know, four or five days is because of the disruptions that were local specific, right, to some of the power generators, uh, you know, that you have, uh, you know, affected by the earthquake, right? Yeah, but the time, look, I mean, I didn't time, nobody times the earthquake, right? And I don't think Mr. Putin has, has it in his ability to do that yet, right? Um, you know, so, so that's, that's coincidental, right? But your overarching point is a very, very important one, right? 
you and I live in a country that is basically 100% dependent on energy on the global market price for energy, right? There are some buffers, you can have long-term contracts, you know, so you promised me to sell the oil at 80 bucks, right, for five years. But effectively what happens is that for every $10 increase in the price of oil, if it is being sustained for about three months, you find that your cost of living as a Japanese consumer, right, goes down by about a quarter of a percent, right, just from the increase in the, uh, in the utility costs, right? So Prime Minister Kishida, now that it looks like global energy prices are going to stay elevated for the foreseeable future, right, they are debating in parliament to actually reduce the tax take on gasoline, for example, right? So that the cost for you and me, because you know the tax rate is being reduced, is going to be ameliorated, a little bit of a buffer coming in there, right? But the overarching problem that you have is the fact that on top of the energy imports, you are dependent for your caloric intake on global food prices. And that's something, I mean, you know, har not harvesting time, planting time in the Ukraine is in the next six weeks. I don't think there's gonna be a lot of things planted. You know, so that's gonna catch up with us, right? In terms of rising prices that are here to stay. And that's the important thing. These are not supply bottlenecks that you can solve by asking OPEC, right, to, uh, to increase production, which can happen literally over a week, right? These are one-year, two-year lead times that you actually have, right? Uh, no, but of the urea, right, of the basic input there, again, Ukraine supplies about 40%, Ukraine and Russia, right? So that's, in fact, you've put, that's the first indicator I look at every morning when I wake up, right, um, is uh, the price of fertilizer, right? Because that's, that is, I mean, again, you, you want canaries in the, sorry, in, in my day job, right? You, I need leading indicators. I, I need the stuff that makes stuff, right? If I know what's happening to that price, I know what will happen with the other price, right? And, you know, the fertilizer price is off the charts, which is being affected also by the People's Republic of China, right? And by unfortunately, a policy in the United States of America, right, where basically, you know, the production for environmental reasons has been very, very severely curtailed, right? America used to provide, right, um, you know, about a third, right, um, of the input material. Now it provides basically zero. And that's basically because of ESG, because of environmental concerns. I'm not arguing against it, but there's a price for everything. Right. Anyway, if that if that answers your question a little bit. Thank you so much. That was a great question. All of them have been great questions. Feel free to stick around and ask Jasper as well if you have additional questions. Uh, that is time. Thank you so much, Jasper, for joining us tonight.